So welcome everyone. I'm Beth Webb, one of the librarians here, and I hope this is the first of many travel dialogues. I know we're all diehard travelers, and if you go somewhere exciting, let me know so that I can try to plan a trip and you can talk about your trip. Uh, everybody loves to share stories. So uh, we're going to jump right in. Uh, Linda Reinhardt uh, went on a trip to Australia, New Zealand, April, May uh, last year. And she traveled with a company. What's the name of that company? Uh, with Overseas Adventure Travel. It's okay. a small, small group of, uh, there were 13 of us in the group. And the beauty, I think, of that, they take care of all those details for you. And um, you got to meet new friends and have such a good time. So I know you've been on several trips with them now. She's giving them a... Uh, probably a shout out so um, okay I'll let you go ahead okay well thank you it's uh, really nice to see so many people here I'm glad that there aren't more presenters than there are audience members that's great <laughs> um, I don't know I know a number of you have been to Australia and New Zealand already and we'll have s stories to share uh, yourselves after uh, the presentations but uh, we wanted to share with you our experiences and uh, because we had such a, such a good time there. I think we all went in different ways. I went with a small group. It was a, uh, a, a tour with a, a company that provide, took care of all the details for us. Went in uh, April and in May, which is uh, their autumn. So uh, it, it got kind of cool there toward the end when we were in New, in New Zealand. But uh, uh, we, I don't know if you can see all the detail of the, uh, uh, the map there, but we f flew into Sydney, uh, went to Tasmania for a few days, and then proceed went back to Melbourne, and then uh, Adelaide, Alice Springs up in the middle, and then Cairns, uh, the, the Great Barrier Reef area, and then finished up in Sydney, and then flew to uh, New Zealand for about a week. Uh, you know, the, the one thing that you have to uh, uh, watch out for are... Uh, the the cars that are on the other side of the road so the uh, Australia is really accustomed to having people who need to be reminded to look right before you cross step into an intersection so that was a I got that picture um, the first day in Sydney I was real happy to, that they reminded me that I needed to look right and um, you don't see a Tasmanian Devil Crossing morning <laughs> very often you, and that was not in uh, Sydney that was in Tasmania but uh, we stopped the bus in order to take a picture of that sign whoops went too far so from Sydney I went there the day before the tour started to kind of have a day to kind of uh, uh, adjust my circadian rhythms before the tour started but it was really fun because I stayed at a hotel where our group was going to be staying at the next night and uh, it was close to uh, the Sydney Harbor so I just walked around you know we got in around or I got in around nine o'clock in the morning and had um, couldn't check into my room until three o'clock but I could check my bags and uh, so I just checked my bags and uh, wandered around for a day and walked around Sydney Harbor it was, it was great but then the next day we flew to Tasmania and we went to Hobart, the capital, uh, Bonnerong Wildlife Park. These are just kind of the highlights of the, of the Tasmania trip for me. Bonnerong Wildlife Park, Port Arthur, the prison colony that they have uh, uh, restored. Uh, Cradle Mountain National Park uh, in the middle of the, of the island. And then um, uh, Launceston is where we finished up and flew out from Launceston back to the um, the mainland. Port Arthur, you know, the, uh, if you were uh, a prisoner, it was horrible. Uh, but if you were, and this was the uh, chap, oops, excuse me, on the left, went back too far. On the uh, left here is the chapel for the prisoners where the, uh, they kept the sides up very high so prisoners wouldn't be able to talk to each other during the chapel service. On the right is a picture of the um, gardens, and they were lovely grounds for the people that were running the uh, prison, but an awful place if you were a prisoner. Uh, these are these uh, pictures are not from uh, Port Arthur. I, I took <coughs> them um, at the uh, uh, museum in uh, Hobart, but you can see the kinds of uh, chains that they use on the prisoners. These ones on the right, they're in the... <laughs> Hitting the wrong button there. Uh, somehow I got out. Can you get me back into my slideshow? 
But the picture on the um, the right, those um, chains are bigger around than uh, I, I could that I could reach with my finger and thumb. They're just uh, huge. Uh, the next day we went to Bonnerong Wildlife Park, and I know that, thank you, I know that uh, Carol and Greg uh, were there and have uh, pictures and stories to tell. Uh, there's a gal holding a wombat and me petting a uh, big wallaby. And uh, uh, did see some Tasmanian devils, mm -hmm. including, I'm not sure if the video clips are gonna work. Maybe not, I'm not sure how to start that video clip. So we'll just skip the video clips. Um, Cradle Mountain National Park in the middle of, the, of, the, of Tasmania is gorgeous area. We hiked around there and looked at the uh, mountain from a variety of angles. Uh, the night that we spent there, we went uh, spotlighting uh, on Cradle Mountain. Uh, got on a bus, uh, with a couple of big spotlights that could be adjusted and we were able to find uh, guys that were doing it were terrific being able to f spot these uh, uh, wombats and patty melons uh, and uh, wallabies uh, in the uh, in the uh, in the woods it's in the dark it's, they were really cool uh, I, I've got a couple of video clips here but I can't show them um, Platypus swimming, they were fascinating. We saw them at the platypus house. I think uh, Greg and Carol will be able to tell you about their experiences actually seeing them in the wild. But platypuses and uh, echidnas at the platypus house in Launceston. Um, then we flew back to the mainland to, uh, to Melbourne. And the big uh, uh, highlights for me in Melbourne were going to the old Melbourne jail. They really concentrate on the history of Ned Kelly uh, shopping, I didn't do much shopping, but the arcades are gorgeous. Uh, the, uh, I'll show you a couple of pictures of that. And uh, Melbourne's a city of trams. So, uh, uh, and the tram that goes around the center of the city is free. So you can just, it takes about an hour to ride around. It was really interesting, you could see, see a lot that way. And then we made a side trip out to the uh, Western Plains outside of Melbourne to um, uh, go while uh, looking for koalas and kangaroos. The picture on the right is the uh, Flinders Street Station, which re is really a landmark in, uh, in Melbourne that uh, got all the clocks there with different uh, time zones, and that's a real common place to meet, to meet, meet by the clocks at the Flinders Street Station. Some pictures from the jail. This is a typical cell. Uh, the guide that we had there was terrific. He uh, showed us uh, uh, this is a kind of hooded mask that the prisoners wore. Uh, there was a system that was called the Pennsylvania system. Apparently the Quakers in Pennsylvania had this idea that the way to handle prisoners was to make them silent and uh, private uh, in solitude so that they could, I guess, you know, think about their sins and think about you know, the better way that they could choose in life. Well, we know now that it probably drove them crazy, but uh, uh, that was the, the, the theory at, at the time. So, you know, it was, wasn't intended to be punishment, but it was you know, very punitive to have to wear these uh, hooded masks. And then uh, this is the uh, uh, flogging rack. So you can imagine somebody tied to that and uh, the guy with the cat of nine's tail um, you know, going, going after it. The arcades were gorgeous, Victorian architecture. Uh, on the hour, these two, Figurines uh, uh, move. Uh, they're mechanical uh, wind-up uh, mechanisms, and uh, kind of a, a typical uh, window in this uh, ar arcade in, in Melbourne of a shop, fancy shops. Uh, there are a couple of pictures of trams, and from Melbourne down there on the bottom. Whoops. I'm in trouble with these. We uh, flew to Adelaide. And in Adelaide, that's wine country. I didn't go on a wine tour. There just was so much to see. I didn't uh, choose to go on the wine tour of the Barossa Valley. But we went to <coughs> Cleveland Wildlife Park. Uh, and the Museum of South Australia in Adelaide is the place to go if you're interested in uh, Aboriginal artifacts. And the Central Market in Adelaide was terrific, too. I'm standing here in the uh, Central Arcade by a uh, 
uh, fountain. And here I am. We were there at the Cleveland Wildlife Park on a rainy day, so it means the crowds were down. And so we got to spend quite a bit of time uh, standing next to koalas. You have to pay $20 to hold a koala, but uh, you could pose with a koala for free. <laughs> And uh, at the uh, Museum of South Australia in Adelaide, they were having a special exhibit of uh, Yadaki. It was about uh, uh, didgeridoos. And so they had a special exhibit. It was really terrific, the, the kind of how didgeridoos are incorporated into Australian music, uh, Aboriginal music you know, that's traditional, but also incorporated into modern music. And then on the left are some uh, display of boomerangs that were at the museum there. The Central Market, uh, one, you know, some things that kind of caught my eye were the kangaroo meat stand. Uh, we're game if you are, is the sign. A smelly cheese shop, and then in the uh, Arc Adelaide Arcade, where I had my picture taken with the uh, 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 fountain, there are some um, bronze pigs running around, or not running around, posing. <laughs> uh, just kind of interesting. From Adelaide, we flew to Alice Springs, and you may be catching on that we did a lot of flying. You know, it, Australia is a big, a big country. It's a, uh, it's about the size, roughly the size of the continental United States. So if you want to get around, you really need to, uh, to fly. So we were spending uh, a lot of time at, uh, at airports, and we flew from Adelaide to um, Alice Springs, and. Uh, I took, took this picture just to show kind of what, how dry Alice Springs is. Tasmania was very lush, but Central Australia is very dry. And uh, Adelaide is the middle of the continent, and it's got a lot of stuff going on there. There's the Royal Flying Doctor Service that uh, uh, uses planes and helicopters to get doctors to uh, patients who are ill and to, to uh, transport the patients to uh, hospitals in the big cities. Uh, the uh, old telegraph station, uh, there's a terrific desert park and a, a reptile center. The guy there will tell you more about reptiles than you cared, you know, you'll ever remember. Uh, the School of the Air um, is 66 years old. It's, uh, this was a way that uh, kids who were in cattle and, and sheep stations all over the country uh, would be able to go to school. And then the Todd Mall uh, is the only mall in Alice Springs, but uh, it has a terrific Aboriginal fabric shop. And the, the uh, pillowcase I have there came, came from there. That was something that uh, our guide recommended was a you know, good thing to buy because fabric is you know, flat, you know, it packs well. And um, they use Aboriginal uh, uh, prints uh, as the basis of their uh, fabrics. And the old telegraph station in Alice Springs, they were ha there was a special exhibit going on there that day we were there. And there's a dingo at the desert park, and a, I don't know what kind of reptile that is, but there's a, just a representative reptile from the Reptile Center in Alice Springs. The School of the Air, I took a few pictures here. Uh, the one on the left I took, this was the, our guide, or excuse me, the uh, person who was leading the tour, but that's the Aboriginal flag in Australia. And the Australian government uh, is making a real concerted effort to use the Aboriginal flag. They fly the Aboriginal flag over all the uh, um, government buildings, uh, trying, trying to do their best to uh, make amends uh, to the Aboriginal people for the uh, uh, you know, injustices that uh, they've suffered in the past and are still suffering, but uh, they're making some, the government's making some gestures toward the Aboriginal people. Uh, up in the upper right is a quilt that the kids made, and then this on the lower right is a picture of the studio that shows that it's 66 years. We took a coach from Alice Springs to Uluru, or Ayers Rock, and on the way we stopped at a camel farm, and that's me and uh, Bill, uh, one of our uh, people on the trip with me uh, riding a camel and we stopped at Curtin Springs, a cattle station or sheep station and um, had an interesting uh, bathroom there. If you can read that, it's blokes on yeah, one blokes. side and Sheila's on the, on the left. Here I am at uh, Uluru, Ayers Rock. Uh, you notice there's a glass of champagne in my hand. That's a tradition that you uh, go there for sunset and, and have uh, you know, uh, champagne and, and uh, cheese and crackers as you're watching the sun go down. But before the sun set, we went to the 
Mutichulu Waterhole. I wrote these names down so I, because I knew I wouldn't be able to remember, but the Mutichulu Waterhole, uh, and then the next day, after sunrise at Uluru, we went to the uh, Uluru Katajuta Cultural Center uh, that is run by the Aboriginal people who live in that uh, uh, part of the c country. And uh, that place is so sacred to them that they won't even let you take a picture of the outside of the building, uh, let alone the inside. So it was, it was really fascinating. And my one regret of the whole trip, I think, is that we didn't have more time to spend there because it was really neat uh, and could have spent a lot more time than we had. Then uh, we went to the Katajuta, uh, uh, in English they're often referred to as the Olgas, and walked up Waipa Gorge. Here's some pictures from the uh, Mutajil waterhole. This is in Ayers Rock, in Uluru, but there's some areas, there are some springs in there, in, in the rock, and there's this waterhole and pictographs. I don't know how well you can see them in the, in the two photographs on the right, uh, but it, it was beautiful. And then there's Uluru at sunset, and Uluru at sunrise from the opposite side, I, could, I took a lot more pictures, as you can imagine, but I just picked one of it from oh, sunset and one from sunrise. And then here's the Katajulta, the uh, Olgas, and then kind of, whoops. Uh, get that right. Going up through there is the Waipita, Waipita Gorge. It was just lovely. It, uh, streams, a little bit of a... Uh, uh, what, rivulets of water coming down this uh, this beautiful gorge and uh, big beautiful red rocks on either side as you're walking up. Uh, from Ayers Rock, we went back to Alice Springs and flew to Cairns up to, uh, toward the uh, Great Barrier Reef area. And uh, uh, in Australia, they pronounce it Cairns. I felt kind of affected saying that, but everybody else there was saying cans, so that's the way they pronounce it. Uh, we actually stayed in Palm Cove, which was a little bit north of Cairns, and it was a quieter place. Cairns is a pretty busy uh, city. Uh, and uh, the, the, uh, uh, the following day, we went to the, uh, the Great Barrier Reef to Michaelmas Cay, and uh, we went on uh, a tour that was a combination of, uh, of a submersible semi-submersible uh, boat and snorkeling. There are other tours that are more snorkeling and scuba diving, but I think it was appropriate for our group to uh, do the semi-submersible and snorkeling options. So uh, we didn't have to, uh, uh, we didn't have to go into the uh, water, put on a mask if people weren't comfortable doing that. Uh, the next day we went to Mossman Gorge in the Daintree Rainforest uh, and uh, we took a Daintree Wildlife Cruise to see some crocodiles. Uh, but here are a couple of pictures from the uh, semi-submersible. So we you know, crawled in the, the, um, entr the entrance is back here. We crawled down in there and went. And the first person went out, that was me actually, went all the way up to the front. So I was able to turn around and take a picture of everybody uh, under, you know, in, in the uh, submersible, semi-submersible, but it was kind of a murky, the water was kind of murky, so we didn't really get, you know, good viewing of the coral there, so I'm really glad I went snorkeling, uh, so I got a lot better view of the, uh, of the coral that way, but I didn't have an underwater camera, so I don't have anything to show you, but they were beautiful. And when we went snorkeling, we uh, went from our boat out to, uh, my, took little uh, shuttle boats to uh, uh, this beach area here where we got into the uh, snorkeling e equipment. But we needed to, they required that we wore uh, uh, spandex uh, suit, you know, body suits be, uh, to pre protect us from the sun, but also to possibly protect us from uh, stingrays. Um, but that was a it was a it was a wonderful day there. Uh, Mossman Gorge is you know further north. It's a rain tree in the Daintree Rainforest, and uh, 
This guy was uh, terrific. Uh, he's an Aboriginal person. Uh, the Aboriginal people in this part of the uh, country uh, have their act together and have uh, a school to teach the kids about their culture. And, uh, uh, and this man, uh, Mookie, was tr you know, terrific. He knew all sorts of uh, folk medicine and, and folk uh, 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 tr you know, tricks of you know, the different plants and so forth. We had a doctor in our group who was just fascinated by this man and wanted to keep in touch with him because he wanted to you know, learn about the indigenous people and the, and the pharmacology, um, you know, trying to figure out what is the pharmacological effects of some of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, leaves and uh, plants that uh, uh, Mookie uses in, in uh, uh, his, uh, his healing and uh, in uh, just every you know, day to day stuff, what they use for uh, uh, paint, what they use for soap and so forth. And he also played the didgeridoo for us. Uh, so that was, that was a really cool experience. So f later that afternoon, we went on our uh, uh, cruise on the river, saw a few crocodiles, but I didn't get any really good pictures of crocodiles, so uh, didn't think that was worth uh, take, taking time for here. We flew from Cairns to uh, Sydney, and Sydney is just spectacular. It is a world-class city. Uh, I would sure recommend taking a city bus tour because it's a big area, and you just you know can't can't do it on your own, I don't think any other way, except by, by car uh, or, or some kind of motor vehicle. Uh, went out, you know, all over Sydney to uh, 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 around some of the beaches, got to see where uh, Nicole Kidman and Kurt Urban live. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, the guy was pointing, this is where so-and-so, so he saw where Russell Crowe lives when he's in Sydney and all those things. Uh, Sydney Harbor Cruise was spectacular, uh, and, and touring, we took a tour of the Opera House, and I would highly recommend that. I went to a performance at the Sydney Opera House. I wasn't in one of the big uh, opera halls or symphony halls. It was in a, a smaller theater, but uh, when I show you, well, maybe you'll see it in this picture, uh, the uh, areas down here are used for uh, cafes and stuff. So there are lots of people there at night that are not going to a play or a concert, but they're there to eat and drink and socialize and look out over the bay. And, and uh, this is what it looks like at night. It's just gorgeous. And this is a picture I took when we were doing our, our uh, harbor cruise. Uh, Sydney Harbor Bridge, you can if you uh, uh, are daring enough. Uh, uh, climb the bridge and go all the way across this way. Uh, they have you wear a jumpsuit so that's the color of the bridge so you don't distract drivers. Um, I didn't go that way. I thought you know, just walking across that way would be, be high enough for me. And you can see a lot, there are lots of other people who walk across the bridge. But you got some spectacular views that way. And this is an area right by Sydney Harbor called The Rocks. It was a really old uh, neighborhood um, in, uh, in Sydney. But I thought this was kind of a cool picture on the left because it shows the, the, the mix of the old buildings from the you know, 18, 17, 1800s and the uh, modern skyscrapers behind them. Um, from Sydney, we flew to New Zealand, okay? And when we were in New Zealand, we were only there about five or, five or six days. We uh, went to Auckland in the North Island and spent a day there. Then we flew to Christchurch in the uh, South Island and uh, took a, a coach uh, down to, to uh, Queensland, Queenstown. And uh, in Auckland, I sure recommend the uh, museum there that has Maori art and uh, cultural uh, things. And then Christchurch, we didn't spend any time there because they're still recovering from an earthquake. And our bus driver said it, they're doing so much construction and it's, uh, you know, day to day they're blocking off different roads. She just didn't want to be driving a coach through, uh, new, uh, through those uh, those kinds of conditions. So we didn't drive into Christchurch. We went out into the country right away 
And the, the countryside in, in New Zealand is just beautiful. We went to a sheep dog and sheep shearing demonstration, went shopping at the place called the Tin Shed, which specializes in merino wool and uh, a blend of merino wool and furry tail possum fur which makes a beautiful blend. And if I've got a hat over there if you want to touch it. It's, it's really nice. But uh, using these possums is uh, an ecological thing to do because uh, there are at one point 80 million of these furry tailed possums in New Zealand, way more than you know possums and people. They've got it down to 40 million now. But if you use possum fur, um, it um, helps them pay for eradicating the, the, the possums. The furry-tailed possums are a lot cuter than our North American possums. Uh, and the, and they, it makes a real nice book. Uh, okay, I guess I'm going a little bit fat, uh, too slowly here, but uh, I'm sorry, I need to apologize. Uh, uh, we went to uh, uh, Queenstown, which is kind of the adrenaline capital of, South, of uh, New Zealand. Now, this is what we saw at uh, the Auckland Museum. Uh, saw the, uh, the Maori do the uh, uh, haka and other demonstrations. Beautiful carved wood at, uh, Maoris are known for. Uh, in, uh, this is a lake. We, we could not quite see Mount Cook. But uh, we did get to see some fall autumn colors in uh, New Zealand. Uh, we took a day trip to the Milford Sound, stopping at Mirror Lakes on the way. And Milford Sound is spectacular. And it really looked like uh, Lord of the Rings territory. Okay. And uh, uh, for our adrenaline rush, we went on the shot shot over jet boat ride, but Prince William and Kate did that once too, so we're a good company. And then for kind of sentimental reasons, I took a ride on the TSS Earnshaw, Earnslaw. It's a uh, coal-powered steamboat uh, that's on the uh, Lake Wakatipu in uh, uh, Queenstown that uh, is, was built at the same year as the Titanic, and it's still afloat. So that's kind of the highlights of my, my trip. Uh, okay, we're going to switch to the Roy's, Greg and Carol. Thank you, Linda. I, um, everybody remind me we should have a session on how to pack for these trips, right? Yeah. And something on photography. My gosh, are those all your own photographs? Yeah. That, just wonderful photography. So Greg and Carol Roy uh, had a lovely, well, what could be better? They were welcomed in Australia by Australian friends who could tour them around and drive on that wrong side of the road. Yeah. I mean, there's nothing better. I think you had the ideal trip. And while we're thinking of it, Carol recommended I buy Tim Tams, which are uh, Australian biscuits. And they are on the back table if you want to try them. Apparently, they're very popular in Australia. So I will let you two go ahead. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Carol's going to interject here as much as she wants, so please do. Uh, obviously, when you get, oops, sorry, when you go there, the first thing you're going to hear is, good eye, mate. And instead of saying, good for you, it's, good on you, mate. And that's how they, that's how they talk, and it really <laughs> makes you feel wonderful. Um, uh, there's our friendly koala bear that everybody goes crazy about. So uh, we went on a, on a different route because the country's so big. We decided, uh, where's the little pointer here? I don't. The red, the red oh. at the top. Okay. Um, we decided, uh, our friends live in Sydney. Uh, we decided to do Alice Springs and Uluru, and then we flew down to Adelaide, did the great coastal road, which I'll show you with some of the pictures, jumped from Melbourne over to Tassie. We went to Tasmania, where time has stopped. It's absolutely amazing. And then from there, we returned back to Sydney, took a cruise to New Zealand. And we did uh, a 14 day cruise around New Zealand, returned back to Sydney, and then uh, back home. Canberra. Canberra. What? We also went to Canberra, oh, yeah, we went which to the is the capital of all of the states of yeah. Australia. When our friends had been here in the United States last March, we took them to Washington, D.C., so they thought it would be good if we went to Canberra, which is their House of Parliament, and we got to see and sit in an open session. 
of their House of Parliament. Yeah, we saw the uh, question time, like they have in Parliament in, uh, in England. They have the same thing in Australia, and it was wonderful. Uh, at one point, my wife was ready to yell at the, uh, the delegates to keep quiet because they kept interrupting the Prime Minister as he was trying to make a point because they're all yelling, you're lying, it's not true, and things like that, and it was just really fun. For distances, oh, sorry, sorry, I'll go back, <laughs> this thing is fun. Okay, distances, just to give you some examples, uh, 15,000 kilometers to London, yeah. 9,000 miles. <laughs> so we're on the opposite side of the world. There's the international date line right here. So when you fly, you lose, right? It's time, time warp, time travel. So you, you lose a day. You make it up when you come back, but it's still a son of a gun. So then we also went to Uluru, and that's uh, Ayers Rock, very sacred uh, um, area. And I don't want to step on Linda's uh, information, but I do want to tell you these, those paintings on these rocks are original, number one. Number two, they're so high up, you can't touch them. And number three, the air is so dry, the humidity is non-existent, those are 50,000 years old, and they're not touched. That's the amazing part of this. Uh, the um, Aboriginal uh, civilization is one of the oldest that we know of in the world. Now, when we went to the Uluru uh, uh, Aboriginal Center, uh, their timeline started at 500,000 BC. They had a language at 50,000 BC, and our modern language, language comes from the Sumerians, 5,000 BC. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the uh, rocks of, of Australia are the oldest in the world. They date back to over four billion years old. It's just amazing, just amazing. It's the land that time forgot, basically. And from there, we went to, the, uh, of course, the, the desert, Alice Springs, McDonald Ranges, uh, the radio school for the air, uh, we've already talked about that, but the, uh, the, the, uh, this, is, this was in um, September, and the temperatures were already 80 degrees. Yeah. Very warm. Uh, I bought a hat just very, very similar to Linda to keep the sun off my head because it was really warm. Um, phenomenon, in, in the city of Alice Springs runs a river called the Todd River. Something like yeah. that. But you look at it, and it's a dry sand bed. Not so. You, dr dig, you drill three feet down, and it's a raging river of water. It's the most incredible thing. And we just couldn't believe it. And the Aboriginals, have, that's how they subsist. But you have to walk across this bridge, which is, you look, and there's absolutely no water. Yeah, but there nothing. are a lot of eucalyptus trees, or eucalypts, that know, and their roots are down there in the water getting their refreshment. From there, we flew down to, from uh, Uluru and Alice Springs, we flew to Adelaide. And these are just some of the typical uh, housing. This is the governor's mansion right there. That was a built about the 1850s and very, very British. Uh, these are some of the other homes. Uh, these typical homes are one and a half million dollars. Very expensive to live in Australia, very expensive. Uh, you went to the market, we did too, and that does say crocodile tail fillet, <laughs> in case you're wondering. This one up here is emu tongue, oh. emu tongue. And uh, then from there, we went to the wine country, and uh, among some of the best Syrah, Medoc, and Merlots that we've ever had, it's just amazing. Um, this is just a small sample of the, uh, the Borassa Valley, and there's another one called the McLaren Valley. Um, and it's going to sound crazy, but uh, Napa Valley has nothing compared to these. The sizes of these things are huge, huge beyond what we have in, uh, in California. And the wine is wonderful, and it's not that expensive. Uh, you can get it at most good liquor stores, except don't go and get Yellowtail. <laughs> Yellowtail to them is rot gut. <laughs> it's really bad. Uh, but their wine is just, just phenomenal, just phenomenal. Now from there we went to Kangaroo Island, just off the coast of Adelaide. And true to its name, it's all about wildlife. And there's your kangaroo sure. sign. Their problem with kangaroos is the same as our problem with deer. They come right at you, right out of nowhere, you hit them, you're done. Your car is totaled, etc. Um, they are amazing. Um, 
this is a wallaby. It's a little bit smaller than a kangaroo, and it's darker. It's a darker color. The kangaroo, this fella here, this was done on this, my tablet here. I blew it up. That guy is six and a half feet high. He's huge. And he probably weighs about a thousand pounds. They're very big and very powerful. Um, so anyway, that's out in the bush. Yes, you were going to say? Um, the, uh, this, the, these are uh, Arctic snow geese. Uh, beautiful birds, very large, and uh, pretty much used to humans. Uh, a whole flock of, uh, of seals just sunning themselves here, sea lions, and then pelicans. This was interesting because this was at this little port, and I forget the name of it, in, on, on uh, Tassie. And what this, uh, they were coming. It's Kangaroo Island. They were on their way, yeah, it's Kangaroo Island. They were on their way to get fed by a gentleman who fed them every day at a certain hour. The problem was the government stopped him from doing it, and they still came just because we were people. <laughs> so as soon as they see people, they come out of the water, and they start walking over. And they stand about about that high. They're, they're not small. They're pretty, pretty large birds. Um, okay, okay, let me go to the next. Ah, this is funny. Now, of course, you can see our host here is driving on the right side of the road, and we're in the back seat, and this is called a standoff. That's a herd of sheep right there. 20-minute <laughs> standoff. They were in the middle of the road. They kept looking at us. We just kept looking at them. And finally, after 20 minutes, they decided to turn and go back to the pasture. But the sheep are really, what, the, they don't have any leaders. Can I get in a little bit here? Please do. I would like to add a couple of things. Yeah. When we were on Kangaroo Island, the roads can go from paved roads to dirt yeah. roads yeah. in just a heartbeat, crossing over an intersection. And when we saw these sheep, we stopped and they stopped. Yeah. And then we decided we would move forward a little bit. Maybe they would get off the road. Well, they decided to move forward a little yeah. bit as well. <laughs> so we went, we tried again, and they did. And finally, it was like we got close enough to each other that they just turned tail and went the other way and finally off the road. But it was funny. So uh, thank you. Now let's see if I can get this to go. Yeah. And now we're on the Great Ocean Road. Um, and the sights you're going to see are just phenomenal, absolutely incredible. Uh, Carol, do you remember the name of this beach here? Because no. look at the color of the water. I hope this it doesn't really justify it, but the colors are just gorgeous. Um, it, these cliffs heads are basically sandstone. So what you're going to see are incredible rock formations. This is a, a, a light, uh, an old light out of um, a, a town called Roby, R-O-B-E. Uh, it was the um, number one uh, stop for the Chinese when they immigrated into the country in the 1850s and 60s. So this was the number one stop for them. Anything you want to add, Carol? Mm -mm. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can get this to run. Nope. Can I get that to run? How does it run? Phil? The video? Phil? I don't know. Yeah, we'll That's all right. Oh, I just killed it. That's all right. Um, I don't know where it went. There's a sea cave, a typical sea cave, um, and of course the um, the cliffs. And I wish that would run because it's a it's a be beautiful sight to see uh, with all of that. Yeah, it doesn't do it. I don't know. So anyway, um, there we go. Thank you. I don't know what I did. That's the wind and the waves. We're about 300 feet up. You can see the other I outer created by the wave action. The government has created all these wonderful uh, walkways and, and things like that so that you can stand there and take pictures. Uh, directly straight ahead is Antarctica about 1,500 miles. This is the Southern Ocean coming right at us. Um, continue on. You can see some more of these rock formations, mm. uh, caves. On on go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Here we go. Here's another one. Uh, if I can get this one to go, it'll be...
large right there. I know you can't really see them, but those are all seals <laughs> underneath the arch, sunning themselves or, or uh, sea lions. So that gives you some indication of the power of the ocean. This, go ahead. When we were, you can go ahead, but I'm going to talk now. When we were um, traveling the Great Ocean Road, our friends had said to us, because they are native Australians, you want to see this. And it really goes all along the coast of South Australia. And as you move along from town to town, you get to see they have different lookout spots. And this is what Greg is coming into now. And this is called London Bridge, because at one point where you see an empty spot, used to be a total bridge. That was an arch. The sea has been doing its eroding yeah. Um, yeah. capabilities for a number of years. So a lot of these things are, you know, who knows how long, but it may not be there. They give that arch about ten to, seven to 10 years before it falls. Yeah. These are big breakers again, 20 foot breakers coming in. And of course, we saw a lot of people surfing in different yeah. areas of the yeah. road. Okay. More sea caves. Keep going, yeah. Yep. There's another view from another vantage point. More sea caves. Okay. Um, this is called the Twelve Apostles, but unfortunately right now there's only 11 because one of them has been taken over by the sea. <laughs> it's a series of rock outcroppings that the Australians have mentioned, have named the Twelve Apostles because there were 12. One of them has fallen into the water, been, you know, and they're saying that these are going to be gone again. I'm not sure how long, but they will not last forever. Right. So if, you, if you're going to Australia, go. Go now. By the way, very, very few Americans do this, this, uh, this portion of the country. They all go to Carnes and Alice Springs, but no, uh, we, met, we met more Chinese and Japanese on this than we did any, any other uh, uh, Americans. Americans. Again, another uh, slide with the, uh, the outcroppings again, and then, of course, the setting sun. And now we go to Tasmania, which is, like I say, the land where, where time forgot. And of course, everything is greener now, much greener. You're uh, at the very southern tip of uh, Australia. Antarctica is now 1,000 miles away. Um, and uh, what we did was uh, we looked into this as a rainforest. Oh, I just don't know how that happened. I know I did. Oh, the slides went going the opposite direction. <laughs> well, anyway. The snow here, uh, this again is in October, so there's snow. This lake is uh, a major uh, uh, reservoir for water for the city of Hobart. And then there's these w waterfalls. Unfortunately, these things flipped on their side. Yeah. So, uh, this is Russell Falls. We went out to yeah. a, a national park and we had a chance to walk. And we were very fortunate that we had a guide who used to be a park ranger. And he was telling us about the flora, the fauna, the eucalypts, how they yep. survived fires, because that is one of the big problems that they get in, in some of the islands, is fire will wipe out whole areas. And this was Russell Falls, which was just yeah. gorgeous. It's a series of steps, step, step, step. And uh, uh, because of the snow and, and recent rain, oh, yeah. it was a torrent. It's usually, it's a trickle. <laughs> so uh, we were very lucky, very lucky. All right, let me move on. Um, that is the uh, actual duckbill platypus that I found or saw and took a quick picture. And um, that's what they look like in the National Geographic magazine. <laughs> and so just to give you the comparison, uh, very, very difficult to see because of their coloring with the water. Uh, echidna is a, what is that, a little porcupine? Sort of. And you saw what? one. Yeah, Tell and one of that. our walks, when we were walking out to London Arch or London Bridge, when we came back, um, we were just walking along the trail, moving toward our car, and I, I looked over, and it looked like a sagebrush or something, just sort of a ball of dust and twigs and what have you. 
And then I looked again, and it moved. <laughs> and my friend said, oh, that's an echidna. <laughs> so we actually saw one in the, in the live. This is from, I think, the zoo, yeah. or the Bonarang. Now we went to Bonarang, same place you were at. There's our same, friend. Same gal. Yeah, same gal. <laughs> uh, the koala, the emu, wonderful emu. And then I've got to say, I'm going to have a great time with this one. But these, these kangaroo, one, they're injured in the, in the uh, in the bush or the outback, they have to come back and be rehabilitated. They get so friendly that they, they, they can't be left let go. So this is what happened. Oh, God, oh it's not. sideways. It's sideways. <laughs> She's feeding them right out of her hand. Oh they they give God. us a bag of grain, and uh, yeah, I just kept. I just kept, and I'm laughing because I can't believe these. They're so friendly. What, what did you have to do? You have to uh, scratch them oh, under the yes. chin. Yeah. We were told there, this Carol, is a, a wildlife sanctuary. Camera. So um, the animals get yeah. brought in to be <laughs> taken care of. And, and this guy, he's this guy is just piggy. Just piggy. <laughs> <laughs> They're both fighting for Oh, me. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, they give you a bag of, of some pellets or some crackers or whatever, and you can feed the kangaroos. They're very, you know, as you can see, very friendly. The um, Tasmanian devil, the wombat, the emu, you don't really feed those animals at all, but the ones that are there in captivity, they're hopefully being ready to be rehabilitated. The devils can go back into the wild. After about, oh, eight months or so, the trainers were saying that they get um, sort of vicious and want to be released, whereas the kangaroos become so attached to the humans that if they put them back in the wild, they would not survive. So most of them they put back, but the kangaroos they have, they keep there. So there's a devil. Um, nasty little animals, uh, they, uh, they, they hunt in packs, and the reason they're called devils is because when they're feeding, they're screaming at each other. They will eat everything, including the bone, complete. That's how vicious they are. Now we're at the southern tip of New Zealand. We're on a cruise ship. And uh, this is the Fjordland National Park in Milford Sound. And it, I've never been to Norway, but this is absolutely stunning, stunning. You have a huge cruise ship coming into this huge Milford Sound. And so those mountains here are 8,000 feet, those, these right here, snow-capped. Um, more, more of the same, beautiful blue, deep water. And then one of the waterfalls, uh, there's so many waterfalls, it's, uh, it's ridiculous, but uh, beautiful waterfalls uh, there and, and the snow-capped peaks. And then we went to one city called Dunedin, and this is the train station that was uh, built in the 1870s, very British looking and, and so forth. And we went to a, a sheep uh, uh, farmer, and you can see how plush and green New Zealand is. It's gorgeous, totally different from Australia. And these are, uh, this gentleman had his two hunting dogs, uh, uh, sorry, sheep dogs. Uh, they were herding the sheep. So uh, we saw that. I just thought I'd throw that in. And finally, um, a nice sun, sunrise on New Zealand as we end our journey and go back to Sydney. So thank you. I have some merino wool if you'd like to. Uh, yeah. I'm gonna pass this around. The other thing, yeah, we did. We bought some merino possum. This is a merino possum sure. sweater. And you'll notice they're real soft and lightweight, and it's wonderful. Oh, yeah, by the way, the Tim Tams are Australian, so enjoy them. They're very good. <laughs> so I hate to move on, but I want to see New Zealand. And uh, Barb Bindlin has a sort of a different trip. You're, a, you're an intrepid, independent traveler. <laughs> Uh, so we want to hear how you planned and, and uh, handled your trip. Yeah, so I'm going to give you a very different perspective on traveling. My husband and my family, we're hikers. We don't do overnight hiking, but we do day hikes. And so we're always looking for places that have good hiking trails. New Zealand has some of the best that we've ever found. So I'm going to talk to you today about places that I went but I want you to know that even if you're not a hiker, buses go to all of these places and you can see everything that I'm going to show you from a bus tour also. Um, New Zealand, of course, is the two islands. Um, 
The national bird for New Zealand is the kiwi. The kiwi is nocturnal. It lives only in New Zealand, but you'll never see it. It's very shy and um, very endangered also. The people of New Zealand call themselves kiwis. Um, there's about 5 million people total in New Zealand, which is less than the population of Wisconsin. Uh, most of them are of European origin, but 15% um, are Maori, and the Maoris are uh, originally from Polynesia. They settled in New Zealand about the same time that the Hawaiian Islands were settled. And the people, the Maoris, that really want to identify as being Maoris will often have facial tattoos. Um, we drove everywhere we went, and that's a problem if you have never driven on the left side of the road. I didn't drive. My husband did the first time we went. We went uh, for six weeks, five years ago, and then just last December, I went with my daughters, and they drove. I was not going to drive on the left-hand <laughs> side. Um, the first time that I went with my husband, five years ago, we spent six weeks in New Zealand, and we did a program. We participated in a program called Woofing, Willing Workers on Organic Farms, where my husband and I worked in people's yards. It wasn't on farms, but in people's yards. We're gardeners, and so we wanted to see how they gardened and what they grew. So we worked in people's yards, and then they provided room and board for us for free. So this was one of our hosts in uh, New Zealand, the two people there. They hosted us for four days, and we worked in their beautiful garden. They had 11 acres of plants from around the world. We were so excited to be working in this particular garden because there were so many things we had never seen before. I basically pulled weeds and deadheaded, and you know it wasn't difficult work. Um, one of the other places we stayed, we helped a woman make a path in her yard. And one of the other places we stayed, we did a lot of trimming in their yard. So for two weeks of our six weeks, we were actually woofing, where we were hosted by the people there. Um, the trip that I just took in December with my two adult daughters, um, we again drove and we stayed in hostels. Now, if you think about what you think of as hostels, you think of like young kids and not very nice places. In New Zealand, this was our first hostel. It was gorgeous. It was, um, this is the room that we had. So we had a private room. That's my daughter, my other daughter is sleeping in the bed there. We had our own private room. And this is the kitchen where we cooked. And so we saved money by staying in hostels and then by cooking all of our meals. And I love staying in hostels because in this very kitchen, we met people from Germany, um, Israel, Zimbabwe, Singapore, Ireland, just in this kitchen for two days. So we met lots of interesting people. This particular hostel had a beautiful garden outside too, so it was just fun to hang around there. Um, this then was a much cheaper hostel that we stayed in, but we had this private cabin. So we've got a little cabin all to ourselves. It's nobody else is in it with us. We've got some sleeping area, and then we had a very simple kitchen. But again, we could cook all of our meals, and we made all of our lunches every day, so we didn't have to eat out at all. Um, one of the things that's very popular in New Zealand for eating is pies, and you think of nice fruit pies, well, these are meat pies. And they sell them everywhere. They even sell them in the uh, gas stations. You can get pie, meat pies. This particular one was a steak and mushroom pie. <laughs> um, sheep are incredibly uh, abundant. Um, there are 10 sheep for every person in New Zealand. And so everywhere you go, you're going to see sheep. We were, my daughters and I were on the South Island, and it's very rural there. And so most of the time, you're driving through sheep company, country. Some other the animals that you might see in New Zealand, this was a baby fur seal. We were out on a beach, and there was a bunch of fur seals playing in a little pool. We were able to get very close. When my husband and I were there, we were on a beach, and we saw a sea lion. 
We were not really that close to this. These can be pretty dangerous animals, but I'm zooming in on it. But we did see the sea lion um, sleeping. Um, this is a bird that is only in New Zealand. It's called a kia. It's an alpine parrot. And they live up in the mountains in uh, New Zealand. And they're very mischievous. They warn you to hold on to your keys and anything that's shiny, or they'll come and grab them from you. And here is one of the Kias ripping off some rubber from somebody's windshield wiper. <laughs> um, they also have, in, in New Zealand, the world's smallest penguin. They're blue penguins. And um, I, I didn't take this picture. Um, the place where we went to see them, you can't take pictures. But, um, so I grabbed this off the internet. So, but they are really blue, and they're very small. And my daughters and I went to uh, this little amphitheater where you can see a penguin show. The penguins all go out to sea uh, during the day to feed. And then at night, they come, all come in at once. They call them in rafts. So there's maybe 100 birds that come in all of a sudden onto the shore. And you're sitting there on bleachers watching them come in. So there's the people there. And there's the, all the penguins that are running right in front of you. We had some penguins that ran about three feet in front of us. Um, this is something that most of you probably wouldn't want to encounter. It's a freshwater eel, and they are in the rivers in New Zealand. We saw this at a place where we stopped to get pottery. There was a little creek there, and that was probably three or three and a half feet long. It's a huge beastie thing. Yeah. Um, my favorite thing to do the last time we were there is uh, went into the glow worm caves. So here's a cave that we're walking into on, the, on a walkway. And inside the cave, there's glow worms that will be on the ceiling. And they actually do glow like stars. So you get in a boat then. And I don't know if, how well you can see it, but this is all what looks like stars. That's actually glow worms. And down here in the water, you can see their reflections even. Wow. So that was fascinating. Is that in the North Island or the South Island? That, they have them in, on both Both. parts of the island, yeah. Um, we did a hike at Mount Cook, which is the highest mountain. Um, this was our, a, a longer hike, but the trails were just perfect there. They were level and, flat and uh, wide and very well maintained. Um, any place that there was wetness, they had boardwalks. Any place there's a river, you get go over a nice suspension bridge. The scenery was beautiful. This particular hike ended at a uh, glacier. So this is a glacier. It's very dirty because as the ice flows through the mountains, it picks up a lot of dirt, and so they often look very dirty. But that is a glacier. And there's my daughter sitting at the lake. And you can see that there's icebergs that have come off the glacier. Um, this was when my, I was with their, went there with my husband. And there are several places that you can see glaciers just five minutes from the parking lots. So you don't have to do a big hike to see glaciers. They're very close by. Um, there are waterfalls everywhere. The country's very, uh, got a lot of high topography, and so there's a lot of waterfalls. Beautiful rivers. The rivers run kind of a turquoise blue. Um, there's a lot of unusual rock formations there. This was called the Clay Cliffs. Here's Elephant Rocks. This is where the part of the Chronicles of Narnia was filmed. Um, this is off the coast. And then this is another place off the coast called the Meraki boulders. They're, they're round boulders that are on the shore. And mo now most people use them for photo ops. <laughs> um, there are sea caves that you can walk into at low tide. At high tide, they're filled with water. But at low tide, you can go out and you can go into the caves. Um, this is a place that's called Hot Water Beach. There's a lot of geothermal activity in New Zealand. And this particular beach, people will dig holes in the sand, and hot water comes, fills the holes, and then they sit there and they bathe in the hot water. Um, part of the island is rainforest. It's temperate rainforest, so it's not tropical, it's not hot. It's a kind of a cool rainforest. Look how green that is. 
Um, and then another thing that grows in the rainforests are these tree ferns. So you all know the little ferns we have in Wisconsin. Well, these are tree ferns that actually have trunks. Um, when you are hiking on many of the trails, you are in sheep pasture. You're going through pastures. And so often you will have to walk on a stile to get over the fence that's keeping the sheep in. Um, we saw lots of beautiful wildflowers. These are foxgloves, which I can't grow in my garden, but they grow everywhere wild in New Zealand. Another gorgeous picture of foxglove and the scenery there. And then this was, we timed our trip. My daughter had been there five years ago and she had seen fields of lupins and I saw her pictures and I thought, okay, I'm going back when the lupins bloom. And we happened to hit it right on the button that we got there right when they were at peak bloom. So this was just fields of them. And here's my daughter saying, can you believe how many lupins there are? And uh, the, it turns out that a woman who was the wife of a sheep farmer didn't think there was enough color in her life, so she's the one who spread lupin seeds 70 years ago. And now they follow the rivers. The seeds come down the rivers, and they've become an invasive species there. But luckily, luckily sheep eat them too. And so they have become forage for sheep also. So um, that's my presentation. Um, New Zealand to me is just kind of one of the spectacular places if you love scenery. And again, every place I've showed you is pretty accessible without having to hike too. I'm ready to go. Anybody else? <laughs> is anyone traveling to us? I, I know two of you are going like this week. Yeah, good for you. And uh, anybody else have a trip planned in the near near future? Someday, someday. And some of you have been there. I know Rose. I don't know where you went, but Rose and Carla. Uh, okay, so this is this is our time to ask questions. Uh, and we are recording for JTV. So if you don't want to take the mic for your question, you can write them down. Uh, just raise your hand. We'll bring you a piece of paper. Uh, but does anybody want to start off with questions? Um, okay. I thought right away um, why they could not feed, why you couldn't feed the pelicans. The pelicans continued to come there because they recognized humans, but you, you couldn't feed them anymore. Actually, the gentleman did continue to feed them. <laughs> because when we were there, he would go out at 5 o'clock, mm. but it was not as usual. There used, he used to attract a whole crowd so that people would come to watch the feeding of the pelicans. Well, he was not he was an older gentleman, and he wasn't about to give it up. He was going to continue to feed the birds. And I'm not sure if it was, uh, did somebody rule on it or somebody in yeah, that city council? Yeah, the government stopped him. The government. Well, they're wild, and, and he was domesticating them they they got dependent upon him feeding them every day so and he did it for years why they would you know yeah. why they wouldn't be able to be fed but thank god for the gentleman that didn't yes <laughs> thank you thank you Did you have any issues with currency? Is it difficult to deal with the money of either Australia or New Zealand? No, and actually with our money, we were much better off. Um, basically, when we were in Australia, it was about, um, I want to say, I, it's the reverse with what I was just about to say. Our, our dollar would buy about a dollar and 20 cents of Australian money. Um, but it was, and in New Zealand, it was almost a dollar and 30 cents. Mm. Uh, yeah, so our currency was stronger at that point. Um, we used a credit card for a lot of things because our credit card did not charge a foreign transaction fee. So, but we also had money around. It is, it is, you know, there were times when I got into some of the coins that I would say, um, well, how much do you need? <laughs> and they would, most people would just take out what they needed and you could figure it out. But the money really was not too difficult. The thing to understand though, sometimes we would see something and it would be, oh, let's say 300 Australian dollars. And you're thinking, oh, that's a lot. Of, but it's really not, it's only approximately 250 American. You know what I mean? You've got to remember the exchange rate as well.
Um, I think there was an animal refuge um, that you showed, I think it was in Tasmania. Yes. <coughs> yes. What is the name of that refuge? Bonorong. Bonorong. B-O-N-O-R-O-N-G. Bonorong. Who else has a question? I want to know about the time. I mean, you were there for almost a month, and you were there for... I was there for six weeks the first time, and then two weeks the second time. You were over a month. We were seven weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a 12 hour flight from LA to New Zealand. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how far it is to Australia. So you have to make sure that you're making, you know, going there for a long enough time to make it worth that long flight. Yeah, it's a 15 hour flight from San Francisco to Sydney. Mm -hmm. And we had then the flight from here to San Francisco. So it is a full day travel. I thought that would be really, really difficult. And it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be because you tend to um, doze a little bit, watch a movie or read a book, you know, get up and walk around a little bit and whatever. But I, I jokingly was saying to my friends when we returned, I said, I've been time traveling because we left here on September 1st but we didn't arrive until September 3rd, <laughs> you know, because we crossed the international date line. It wasn't so bad going, but coming back, we left there on like October 18th at nine in the morning, and we got back here on October 18th at about 10 in the morning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, you lose a whole day going and you come back on the same day. When you said you did all of your cooking, how oh. far uh, you carried, did you carry your food with you no. or was there, were stores accessible? No, when we did our woofing, we were staying with people uh, that hosted us. But when okay. I was with my daughters in the last trip, we were hiking and we didn't do any um, camping overnight. We just, you know, we had grocery stores right nearby or anything. So, but we just... Like, like you do at home. You go to the store, you buy your groceries, and you make them at, at the place that we were staying. Stores are accessible oh, sure. for, for food oh, for sure. under your circumstances. Mm -hmm. Yes, because we weren't really in, in, in uh, places so remote that we weren't near cities. We just chose to be in the country, not in the city. I'm curious about your working, your gardening for them. Did, were you expected to, you know, uh, keep to be busy or, or uh, do a certain, so many hours? Yes, they, they expected, um, when you do the woofing program, um, you're expected to work four or five hours a day. Nobody ever supervised us, but um, you know we were very respectful of making sure that they thought we were good Americans, and so we um, certainly did enough work for them. And then in the afternoon, you could go do whatever you wanted to. Did you always feel safe? A very safe. New Zealand especially is just an extremely, extremely safe place. And I have snake phobia, so I would not have woofed in Australia because they have poisonous snakes there. In New Zealand, they have zero snakes. And so there was nothing to be had that was dangerous in New Zealand. Unlike Australia. Yeah. The, just to add that the cities are extremely clean. You don't see any trash. Uh, you don't see any homeless. Um, they've got them, but we just don't see them. And um, uh, it's very, very neat and orderly. You, you're definitely in a foreign country. Um, uh, so it's really amazing uh, because of the clean cleanliness of the cities and so forth. Uh, I was uh, blessed to, to go to uh, Malaysia in November, October and November. My son flew me over because the, the family lives there now in Kuala Lumpur, and I felt the same way. Kuala Lumpur was just so clean, beautiful mm -hmm. city. Didn't see any homeless or anything. It was, it was just amazing. Um, and driving on the other, the opposite side of the road, but we had, um, they have a chauffeur there for most of their driving and took us everywhere. But it is, it really takes some getting used to. I uh, read after I got home that New Zealand actually has a huge homeless problem. Um, it's mostly in the city of Auckland, which is the okay. largest city on the North Island, and that's where most of the problems are occurring. But it's got one of the highest homeless problems in the world. 
mm-hmm. per capita. Per capita. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. May I ask the two ladies that are about to leave, where are you going? We're going to both Australia and New Zealand. Great. (laughs) We're going to both Australia and New Zealand. We're going to um, New Zealand first, and we are going to hit both of the islands, and then we will go over to Australia. We're mostly going to Melbourne and uh, Sydney. Are you on a tour? No. Oh. Do you know it's very hot there right now? Oh, yeah. (laughs) We've, we've been talking with our friends, or, or not Skyping, but um, Instagram or mm. whatever, with all these things, they have different names, with our friends in Sydney, and they said this is the hottest they've ever imagined. It's 40, in Sydney, it's 45 degrees C, Second. which is approximately 117 to 120 degrees. Yeah. It's very hot. If you were following the Australian Open, you certainly heard about the yeah. hot yes, temperatures. Yes. Yeah. Well, they just had Australia Day this past weekend, uh, in other words, Sunday, and they had to cancel certain outdoor events because of the heat. It was just too much. So, My husband is back there telling me to mention how when I was in the southern part of uh, the South Island, the sun didn't set till 9.30. This was mm-hmm. December. So my husband is at home, and the, the sun is setting at quarter after four, and I'm in New Zealand, and it's setting at 9.30. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 Oh, yes. The uh, New Zealand is in the ozone hole. And so they experience sun hotter than we do. It's not like their temperatures are so much hotter, but the sun's effects mm-hmm. are very hot. And so we saw school children that were out on recess, and they all were required to wear hats. Same in Australia. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yes. And the, um, the Cancer Society of New Zealand supplies sunscreen for all of the school children. Yeah. So isn't there a real rainy period as well where if you're, uh, I think it's, is it Melbourne or somewhere that it's just torrential rains and am I, you didn't have any of that, right? You, you planned it right. <laughs> it, it depends on where you are. If you're going up near Darwin, it's my understanding, and we didn't get there. That's, it, there's, Australia has five states and a couple of territories. And um, Darwin is in the Northwest Territory and apparently they get much more rain than other parts. The middle of the country with Alice Springs and Uluru don't get as much rain. There are very, very little rainfall. They're lucky to get an inch a year, mm, I think dry. somebody was saying. Um, yeah. But the other, in Sydney, we didn't have that much rain. We had a few times of rain, but not a lot no, of rain. No. Uh, Rose and Carla, do you want to make a comment? I know you just got back as well. Any story to share, a special highlight? We had a little bit of rain in Melbourne, and actually they always say in Melbourne, if you give wait a minute or two, it's going to change, because it was, we were there in September, and there was sleet one day, I think, and and some rain, and then there was, it was warmer. We oh. did the mm-hmm. uh, 12-hour ocean road, and that was gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Um, the big things that I think Rose and I liked doing was, in both in Melbourne and in Sydney, they have these free walks. And they're like two to three hour walks. You walk around with a, they're usually college kids, very educated, and they take you out to a lot of neat places, tell you a lot of stories, and then you just give them a tip. And that's kind of a nice way. We did that the very first day when we got to Melbourne, and that was a great way to, you know, see the city and decide where we wanted to go back to. So I don't know. We did snorkeling in cans. That was fun. We actually stayed right on the promenade, which was right on the water, and... We ate all of our meals outside, breakfast, lunch, and dinner in, in cans. That nice. was mm-hmm. a nice treat. Sydney, we did um, the Botanical Garden, and we did actually go see a play at the Opera House, too. That was a highlight. Can you think of anything else? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I want to go back. One second. Someone up here raised their hand. Did you have a question? I was, just, I was wondering a little bit more about the ozone hole or something you mentioned like I know that has nothing to do really with the scenery and stuff but do you know much because I was thinking oh is um you know what my husband that's sitting in the back is probably going to know a little more than I David you want to just say a little tiny bit about the ozone hole (laughs) (laughs) so many of you are aware the ozone hole was an issue with aerosol propellants the CFCs that used to be used in aerosol spray cans 
and it was discovered that those chemicals, those that are also used in refrigerators and air conditioners, were breaking down the ozone layer that protects us from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. And it was particularly pronounced at the poles, um, especially at the South Pole. The good news is that as those chemicals have been banned and the use of them has been cut back, the ozone hole that lets all that ultraviolet light through is shrinking. And it's been documented it's getting smaller and smaller each year. And so the exposure to ultraviolet rays is being reduced. But still, if you're in those countries close to the polar regions, it's odd. Those are colder, but the UV rays are stronger there because of those ozone holes at both poles. Thank you. Sure. Um, my psychic wants to perceive of Australia as one big, huge, empty. Is is that? Am I off track, or is it in general? Is it highly utilized throughout the whole country? No. Uh, Agriculture-wise, and so on. No. The, 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 yeah, the cent, Pretty much the center of Australia is is. Few and far between are people. There are cattle stations, there are stuff, but it's, it's not utilized as much. There are mountain ranges, rocky uh, soils. Um, it's very arid. Arid, so that they don't. Most of, we were, somebody indicated at some point to me, and I forget who, that it's sort of around the periphery you get a lot of population like sydney has a huge population melbourne has a huge population so around the kind of the coasts and yeah around the whole coast and, but you do have some people in the middle but it's not as many and it's very sparse you saw me on my camel ride uh, the reason there are camels in australia is because there were a number of failed attempts to build a telegraph line from Adelaide to Darwin, to Adelaide on the south coast to Darwin on the north coast, couldn't do it. The mules, horses couldn't survive. So mm -hmm. somebody came up with the bright idea, well, maybe camels. And when they used camels, the camels were able to manage the, the really arid conditions there in the center of, the, of Australia. And so there are wild, when the, when the telegraph uh, was uh, finished, they just let the camels go. <laughs> so, so there are wild camels ranging around the middle of Australia. Yeah, like 300,000 of them. Yeah. 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 Uh, to answer your question, however, uh, if you go to the west coast at Perth, that entire area is mining, huge mining um, uh, operations. Rio Tinto, that's their headquarters. Uh, so there's uh, uranium, uh, there's gold, um, uh, I'm not sure about diamonds, but I, I know gold and uranium are the, 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 the two largest that they, that they uh, uh, export. The funny thing about Australia is um, the country is uh, exporting everything to China. Um, and to help me out here, they, the oil, they have only one refinery in the entire country. And uh, they don't produce all their uh, petroleum they export almost 80% of the petroleum that they make, and therefore they have to import petroleum. It's the craziest thing, and, the, and it's the government. Uh, it's, it's, uh, they want to uh, uh, do as much business outside as, as, as opposed to inland. So the, the Australian people aren't too happy about that because everything is going overseas. The other thing that's amazing that really shocked us was the amount of Chinese ownership, the Chinese development um, and and the, the tourists the 90 percent of the tourists are all Chinese but they are buying huge uh, blocks of property in in the cities of Melbourne all the major cities um, and they're built, turning them into apartment buildings um, and uh, the, the rent the is uh, would you would you pay for a thousand dollars a week a week to live in Sydney that's the going rate for rent in Sydney, it's unbelievable. In some places. Yeah, and the, I mean, everything's more expensive. It's it's on parity. They also pay their people more money, uh, salary-wise, mm -hmm. but still, it's extremely expensive. So there's a phenomenon going on right now where the the government is is trying to put a 
uh, a hold or a rein on the development. And just when we left uh, New Zealand, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Janine, whatever her I forget her name, she put out uh, an edict and a law that New Zealanders are no longer allowed to sell their land, their property to foreign, uh, to foreigners, because that's the only way they can control. New Zealand's already seeing what's happening in Australia, and they want to prevent it from happening in New Zealand, because Australia is really, um, it's it's really. It's sad. It's really sad. And it's because everybody's settling around the major cities yep. as well. Yep. And our friends had said, excuse me, <clears throat> our friends were indicating that what they were doing is building high-rise apartments, et cetera. And so we were getting more people per square inch. And the internal resources are not there. Um, they're, they were expecting this summer to have some brownouts because there's not the electrical grid yeah. is not big enough to handle everything. Mm -hmm. The roads right now are, are okay, but they can't handle the increased amount of traffic that's coming at this point in time. Yeah, and they're in a small area. Greg also mentioned the mining. I wanted to mention we there is a train that goes from Darwin to Adelaide. Adelaide or, mm -hmm. and back. It's called the GAN, which is, or GAN, I'm not sure how they pronounce it. it. And it's wonderful, but it also stops at Cooper Pedy, where they mine opals. opals. So opal mining is one of the mm. industries from, yeah. um, and we were hoping to try and get there, but it was just, it's so a little out of the way and would have taken too long. But there's just some fascinating <coughs> spots. But the middle of the country, we were told, why are we flying from Uluru to, or Eris, Rock to um, Alice Springs. Now, Linda took a bus trip, so how long? I'm not sure how we long. From Ayers yeah. Rock to we Alice. did. Yeah. How long was your bus trip? Do you remember? It was half a day. I'm yeah, sure. because we were said, well, the infrastructure isn't there if you really want to spend most of the day on the road getting there, yeah. whereas it was like an hour's flight. So, in the middle of the country, it, and I mean, when you're flying over it, you look down, there's really not a lot of um, population yep. Yep. there. How does the price of meat and groceries fare over there? Yeah. <laughs> Very high. Yeah. Uh, I had a picture of the um, crocodile, uh, whatever it was. It was $31 uh, Australian per kilo. Uh, that's pretty expensive. That's 20, 26, 27 well, US. Sort of I, I know, I know it is, but still. But the beef wasn't, wasn't, no. wasn't inexpensive either. It was pretty. Pretty, uh, pretty pricey. And when we were driving, we were also, of course, buying gas, and it was about nine dollars to the gallon yeah. when oh, you do all yes, the conversions. Yep. 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 How much were those meat pies that you bought? They were cheap. <laughs> yes. oh, and yeah. they're yes. everywhere too. And they're yeah. good. Oh yeah. They, they had some in Australia. Thank you, Barbara. Long coast. Yeah, the meat Wine pies were and good. meat pies. Oh. Oh. Wine was great. Wine was great. Anybody else? For the, how, how do they feel about American? Oh, they like us. They're very happy with us. They're not so happy about the guy in the in the in Washington, but they like <laughs> us. Um, the young man, I'm looking right at you, young sir. Yes, there's a program. You you really you should. Anybody that's under 21, listen to this. I wish I did it when I was your age. They have programs, and Barbara can attest to this. You could go and work there and live there, and and uh, there's kiwi farms on uh, on. Uh, New Zealand, there's other uh, ranches in, in Australia. You can literally go and work there, and they will put you up, they'll feed you, they have insurance, et cetera, et cetera. Like a migrant worker. It, it's great. It's a great way to see the country, and you would have a wonderful time doing it. Because it's a commonwealth, because Australia is a commonwealth of the British, the, uh, a lot of the students will they get a full year off. Uh, from school, and they can travel to any one of the Commonwealth countries and work there. And we met several. We, a, a young waiter from London, I don't know, an, another one from mm -hmm. wherever, and it was just great. Very, very nice. What a way to go. So if you're, if you can do it, do it now. It's great. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I wrote to the New Zealand uh, Rotary Exchange Student mm -hmm. from New Zealand mm. in 79. She came in January. And the season is just opposite. They were picking strawberries. Yes. She comes with summer sandals, and I mean, <laughs> dressed for summer. I couldn't believe it. And she lived with me from January to June. 
And when we picked her up at Chicago, we came home the interstate, you know, all she kept saying was, everything is so flat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. True. And, and True. Uh, she talked about the sheep a lot. They're grass-fed. Well, mm. we had sheep in 4-H, and ours were green-fed, but she had a lot of lamb at our house, and I told her she was lucky because lamb was pretty expensive to buy here. But she was a wonderful... Uh, she was like my fourth daughter. <laughs> <laughs> I had one at Parker, one at Craig, one at Edison, and then her. But we wonderful. all got along wonderful. fine. It was, it was a wonderful experience. There, there's a suggestion for you. She, she was here a year, but she lived with me from January to June. And then in the summertime, they went by bus. A lot of the exchange, they hooked up and went to California, so they had a Greg keeps keeps nudging me here. I brought a couple of show and tell items. One is when we were we discovered that they use their woods in many ways, and we went to one wood place where these coasters, and I'll leave them up here for you to see, are all made from the sycamore tree, and it's something that I don't know where you, they grow. If you, you know our sycamores here in the United States, they only grow to what three or four inch diameter. They're really mm -hmm. small. Exactly the opposite in Australia. Oh, yeah. They th they grow to three foot diameter, huge, and they 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 do all kinds of woodworking with them. Just gorgeous. You can see the color, the, the texture. The green. Just absolutely beautiful. We we couldn't believe it. It was just amazing. And the other thing we saw, well, we saw lots and lots of uh, floral and fauna. I wished I'd had Barbara with me because mm. she would have been able to tell me what yes. everything was. But they have. Um, it's a bottlenose, and I forget the whole name, but it's a, maybe we were looking at an or orange bottlenose tree mm -hmm. or a banksia. Banks. And it looks like they're beautiful little flowers at first, but then they turn into pine cones as they sort of die, or it looks like a mm -hmm. pine cone type thing when it dies. Well, then, as some of them are quite big, they take it, this is what it is, and you can still feel some of the thing on and this happens to be a, a candle holder that they have made out of it and so this was once was from a bottlenose plant that was on the tree so but i bottle just those flower like it like you 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 clean your bottles with bottle brush <laughs> bottle brush yeah that's what it was plants. bottle brush gorgeous colors well most of the the uh, native plants uh, are, or native trees are in the eucalyptus family. They don't uh, no. change color. And I was there in the autumn, and it was only in the cities where you would find gardens where the plants had been brought by the English where you would see f autumn colors. And uh, New Zealand had more trees that had been planted mm -hmm. by the English than, than uh, in Australia, but it was, it was an unusual <coughs> autumn for me because it didn't have the, the color that I would have expected to see. Yeah. No, it wasn't a question, just comment about that program you're talking about. Because I have a friend whose son did that, and he loved it so much that now he's living there permanently <laughs> in New Zealand. So. Well, I'd only know then what I know. Now. So we're at the end of our time. Did, in, did we have one last question? Anybody, anything? They're just eager to hear. Um, I want to thank our presenters. I'm so glad you could come in and share with us. And I want to thank all of you for coming and encourage you to let us know if you're traveling and how it's going and, and uh, happy travels. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you.